Thanks so much for coming to the session on stepping up biennial seed production. Uh, if this is not the room you intended to be in, please feel free to find a different one. Uh, but we're really glad that you're here. Uh, my name is Kit Healy. I work with OSA as the Upper Midwest Research and Education Coordinator. And I have very little experience in biennial seed production. So I was really excited to get to moderate this panel with these wonderfully experienced folks so that I could learn a few things. And we're really excited to share their wisdom and ideas with you all. Um, this is a topic that I recognize we, and we all recognize we have probably have a lot of experience in the room as well. Uh, so we are going to try to leave a lot of time for question and answer in air quotes because some of the answers might also be coming from the questioners, <laughs> uh, if that makes sense. We're really, really interested in cultivating some lateral flows of learning as well. Um, so thank you, thank you so much for being here. Uh, the way that we're going to do this is each of our lovely panelists is gonna give about a 10 minute presentation about their farm, their experience with biennial seed production and some nifty tricks that they've learned along the way. Um, and then we'll take a few questions after each of the panelists. Then we'll come back together and start our conversation. So if you have questions that are more about clarification, about particular techniques that were covered, feel free to ask those at the end of each presentation. If you have questions that are a little bit more general or topics that haven't been covered, maybe save those towards the end, because also that topic might be covered in a subsequent presentation. That all make sense? Okay, great, so to briefly introduce our panelists, um, we have Petra from Fruition Seeds, Lori from Organic Seed Alliance, and Beth uh, from Meadowlark Hearth Organics and Living Environment Foundation. So we will start with Lori. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the biennial session. My title and job at OSA, I am a research and education associate, and I manage our research farm up on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. So we're in a maritime environment. We don't get super cold. Our coldest temperatures are generally in the teens. We with some climate chaos, have been getting more and more snow each year, and unfortunately that snow has been coming in February, sometimes um, mid-January to about mid-February, which can be pretty challenging, because that's the time when some of these biennial and over, overwintering annual crops are waking up. But in general, we are well suited to overwintering uh, seed production. So my experience is in a research realm in doing this kind of seed production and work. And so what I'm gonna tell you about is fairly small scale production and fairly small lots of seed. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with production scale for commercial production of biennial crops, but you know the foundational principles will be the same. I'm gonna tell you about two projects in particular that I've been working on. One of them is a cabbage breeding project that has been funded by Novik, which is an OREI project that uh, OSA has been working on as a collaborator for, I think this is our seventh, seventh or eighth year. So long-term project, which is great for plant breeding and seed production, especially with biennials. That's a challenge because it's a long time frame when you're doing biennial production. So biennial production, meaning that in one year you are producing some sort of storage vessel, whether that's a root or uh, with cabbage, a head, and then the next year you're producing your reproductive parts, you're producing seeds. So you're on a two-year cycle and you need some sort of cold accumulation during the winter known as vernalization. And that can either happen outside or it can happen in a root cellar, it can happen in a cooler, it can happen in a refrigerator, but it's generally about six to eight weeks at 45 degrees or less uh, that allow the crop to experience winter and to accumulate that cold in a way that the plant knows, okay, I've gone through the cold season and then when it starts to warm up again, whether that's spring is happening outside or you're coming out of a cooler, you're coming out of a cellar, 
and the temperature is changing, the plant starts waking up, and it realizes this is a good time to start reproducing. I'm going to have some sun, I'm going to have some warmth, I'm going to have some pollinators, I'm going to have time to make my seed, I'm going to have time to mature my seed. So vernalization is critical when you're dealing with biennials. So first we'll talk about this cabbage project. Uh, if you don't know, this is Nash Huber of Nash's Organic Produce and Squim, and he's been a longtime collaborator of Organic Seed Alliance. And one of the things that's great for us about collaborating with production farmers, they have a lot of production experience. Nash has a ton. And he's also got a lot more land than we do. We have a two-acre research field, and we can make selections out of a two-acre cabbage patch at Nash's. We don't want to grow our entire research farm in cabbage just so that we can have a large selection opportunity. This is me, this is the first year. Um, so the first thing we did was go out and select two kinds of cabbage that Nash and his crew really liked. Granite and red drumhead were the two parents. So we went out and we flagged a bunch of, carrot, a bunch of cabbages that we liked, we dug them up, we cleaned them, we looked at them again once we had them dug up. Uh, we were looking for head quality, we were looking for leaf wrap, we were looking for stem quality bunch of different things. So we dug them all up, brought them home, put them in the greenhouse. I had never done this before. I have a lot of brassica seed production experience. I used to work with Frank Morton at Wild Garden Seed. I did my master's degree here at Oregon State with Jim Myers and worked on broccoli. Brassicas are near and dear to my heart. And I figured this would work. So this is what is referred to as a strain cross. And the idea was that we were trying to sort of find the best of each variety, and we knew that there was no plant that was gonna give us exactly what we wanted all in one plant, but we figured if we had 50 or 80 of them, we would probably get everything we wanted. So if you're looking at this, uh, drum, red drum head is the one that's more red, it's on your left, and granite is on your right. And I wasn't sure, that was actually year one, this is year two, we did the same thing again. And I wasn't really sure whether uh, I would have better success if I cut the heads off or I didn't cut the heads off. So I did half and half. And I just quartered them and then sliced the top off, making sure you don't cut off the growth point in the greenhouse. And then I left the other half. Turns out it didn't actually make much of a difference. So I ended up peeling all of the extra flesh away anyways, because it just got warm and rotten and fell off anyway, so I was just helping the natural process. And then it started to go into reproductive phase, which was made me very happy that we had done something that was working. The idea in bringing them into the greenhouse was that the extra heat would encourage earlier flowering. I would be able to get seed off of them and cleaned and turned around in time to transplant and go back in the field. So I was trying to take a biennial cycle that normally takes two years and compress it into one because we didn't know how long we were gonna have the grant funding. And when you start out with a four-year grant with a biennial crop and you wanna make some progress, you have to get creative. So this was our way of getting creative. Um, you may notice that the set in the middle, this is actually kind of the same photo from different ends. We had a little bit of a nicking challenge. Our red drum head was an earlier flowering uh, than, our, um, than our granite crop, but we felt like we got enough crossing that we were, we were confident that we had something. We got some seeds, which was great. And when we harvested that seed, this is geotextile fabric. It's one of my favorite tools for producing seed. Uh, it's water permeable. So when you have it outside and you've got dew and or rain, your seeds don't sit there in puddles and just mold and start sprouting. Um, the most important thing on this is GR cross RDH and RDH cross GR. I cannot stress enough how much you wanna label things. You wanna label, there's probably um, a flag in the midst of all of those plants or something, because this is what's also, it's called a reciprocal cross, and I was taught Sometimes there's magic in plant breeding, and sometimes things happen that you don't expect, and sometimes things look different, and sometimes they don't. And if you keep them separate, you can see that magic, and if you mix them all together, you might miss it. So um, we're in the 
uh, fifth generation of this, I think now, and I still have these populations separate. And one, I cannot tell you which one, one is looking better than the other. So um, sometimes you just don't know why. And sometimes just a little bit of a different combination can make a big difference out in the field. This is Sam. He also works at Nash's, and he's been another one of our main collaborators and supporters on this project. The most important part of this slide is that the flags are different colors. Um, we did something that was not very smart this year, and, we, and this was about three years ago, and we planted one row of the reciprocal cross, then we planted the other reciprocal cross. So this is granite cross drumhead, this is drumhead cross granite, this is granite cross drumhead, and that's drumhead cross granite. Uh, which was very confusing, and uh, you know, three months, four months after we planted it, the rows aren't quite as straight, so we flagged with different colors to help keep it straight, and then we dug those up, we brought them back, we put them in the greenhouse, and we've reiterated that process. We did transition from planting into pots to planting into the soil, and when we started, we didn't have what is in the background of this picture, which is a 90 by 30 foot high tunnel. And so instead of planting in a 12 by 20 foot greenhouse in pots, we transitioned into the soil and started using pollination cages. The biggest challenge with pollination cages in brassica production, where we are, is aphids. You can see them here. About two days later, it looks like this. Um, I have yet to be able to get on top of this. We have a lot of natural lady beetles um, that just show up in the cages. We've tried green lacewing larvae. We've tried water sprays. We have tried safer soap. We have tried neem. We have tried neem combination sprays. Um, and it's hard. Uh, we get some seed, and because we're doing a breeding project, as long as we get a little bit of seed off a lot of plants, we're okay. But that works in breeding. That doesn't necessarily work at all in commercial production. Um, so this is a challenge that we are still struggling with and still working on. And it's also hard when you believe in the ethos of organic and you believe in cultivating um, natural predators in a natural cycle and you have to go in every four days and spray a chemical, even when it's an organic natural chemical. It just, uh, it's a little hard on the heart. But we do get some seed, uh, there's the seed, and then we process it, turn around, that's our high tunnel. Uh, you do see some shade cloth there. That is not for a production reason, it's because our neighbor across the street was getting a lot of glare off of our greenhouse and was making her life uncomfortable. So uh, that was the solution after trying many things that we came to that seemed to be a compromise for all of us. Uh, so that's the quick wrap on cabbage. Now we're going to move to another crop near and dear to my heart, carrots. Uh, this is a project also funded by OREI called Carrot Improvement for Organic Agriculture. And it is spearheaded by Phil Simon at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the USDA. This, we are in year... Set, not, uh, six... Eight, we're in your eight. I'm also kind of a new mom, so my brain uh, gets a little fuzzy sometimes. So the great thing about having a collaborator, especially a university collaborator, is resources that we don't have at OSA. Um, OSA, sometimes we like to say is tiny but mighty. We are a staff of around 15, and we're, we span several states and um, we do some pretty big stuff because we've got some really powerful partners. And they believe in what we do and we believe in what they do. And Phil Simon, uh, who's actually here with us in the audience and here at the conference with us, has this wonderful resource called the Winter Nursery down in El Centro, California. It's also really nice to go down there. We go down there in the end of February. We're going in a couple weeks where it's nice and sunny and warm and it has beautiful soil for growing carrots. Um, so the way we compress the biennial cycle with carrots is to have a winter nursery. The winter nursery gets planted in early to mid-October, and then Phil goes down and does a couple check-ins on it, and then we all go down usually around the end of February, beginning of March, 
and we hang out in a field that looks like this. I think we've got somewhere around 1,700 plots. That is a ton of breeding material, a bunch of grad student work, a bunch of hybrid industry trial material. Um, this is my favorite trip of the year. There's just a, a lot of phenomenal material out there. I get really excited by carrots that look like this. Um, if any of you know me, you know I've got about 800 pictures that look like this. Um, so that's what we do. We spend a couple days digging up carrots and looking at ones we like. And then we go through and we do what's called the cutting. And we don't actually get through all of that material, but we get through some of it. And all of it gets laid out, cut open, evaluated for external and internal characteristics, and tasted. Every single breeding plot um, that gets advanced or not advanced in Phil's program is tasted every year. And that's an integral part of doing this work with carrots. And we get to see a lot of really fun stuff and spend some fun time down there. This is what it looks like, the picture on the right. Those are stecklings that are ready to go. So we will take these home with us in our suitcases. We'll check them on the plane. Um, we have a refrigerated truck that comes and picks up a couple pallets and takes them back to Wisconsin. And we take them home and we put them in our refrigerator. We literally put them in our kitchen refrigerator for six to eight weeks. And then we plant them out and we grow some seed. This is, yeah. So Kit asked how we pack them to put them in the refrigerator. Actually, that's coming in the very next slide. Um, so what I want to point out here, and let me go back. So we evaluate the whole root. We are looking for shoulder characteristics, tip fill characteristics, color, smoothness, internal core color. And then we don't take the tips home with us. So when they go home with us, they look like this. And you'll notice the tops are trimmed, but there is material left. Sometimes that material gets a little soggy in the um, refrigerator and in storage. And that's OK, as long as the growing tip is still intact. And this is what it looks like um, when it's gone back to Wisconsin, and then it's gotten pulled out. And the important part of this slide are the little wood chips. Those are cedar wood chips. And so we'll put a handful of cedar wood chips in the bag with the carrots to absorb moisture and as a little bit of an antibacterial um, addition. I went to buy some at our local feed store a few months ago when we were packing our carrots. And the guy said, are you sure you want cedar? I said, yes, I am sure I want cedar. And he's like, you know, cedar's not good for plants. And I'm like, that's why I want the cedar. And so we pack it in a paper bag, handful of cedar, and then we actually wrap that in a plastic bag. Um, on our research farm, we poke holes in the plastic bag, and then we put it in a cooler or the refrigerator. And then we take it out and plant it. We're usually planting around Earth Day where we are and with the timing of the, the harvest. And you'll see those are our cabbage cages in the background. Um, an important thing about this slide are the flags. The flags are marking out how big the cage is. We have pollination cages that range from 5 feet by 5 feet to 10 feet by 20 feet. And when you're planting multiple different cages in a row, it's important to know um, that you're going to plant in an area that you don't then have to walk on or dig up for your cage. Um, one of the things that we've learned, this is the frame of the uh, pollination cage, and we have learned to put that up um, before the plants get very big. Uh, ideally, the plants are this big, or we have just planted them when we put the frame up, because when we put the frame up, we're stomping around, we're often using ladders, um, the frame's falling apart, and we're trying to put it back together. So in order to keep the plants from getting smashed, it's nice to at least put the frame up um, when they're little. This is what it looks like when we get the netting on. We buy these cages from Redwood Empire Awning in California. They are specialty made. They'll make any size or shape that you want. Um, they're fabulous. We can talk more about that if you want to find me later. Um, it's also very important to have animals on the farm. They're just good for your heart. As well as rodent control. This is my farm dog, Malcolm. But really the important part of this picture is, again, labeling. And that label tells us that that cage is a 10 foot by 6 foot by 6 foot. Uh, again, we've got multiple sizes. And so 
That's a brand new one, so it's very nicely folded, but um, really nice to keep them labeled and to label them immediately, because if you walk away and have lunch and come back and you don't remember whether it was a 10 by 20 or a 10 by 15, you have to unroll it. Also important to trellis, and we've learned to trellis early and often. Um, again, when you're doing production work, you may, I've learned that the spacing is sometimes different and the plants uh, often grow bigger. Um, they don't love being in cages. I've learned that the orange ones tolerate cages and just are generally better seed producers in the colors. This is what our greenhouse looked like full of carrot cages. We have done inside and outside cage production with carrots. I have not noticed an obvious production difference. Anybody know what this is? Fly larva. This is what we use for pollination. This is what they look like when they come in the mail. I have learned that if it's a cool day or if they come in the afternoon, I put them in my office where it's 70 degrees instead of outside where it's 45 degrees and they don't want to hatch. Uh, they come in a, a styrofoam lined box and they hatch out and they do really great work on umbels. They don't actually pollinate, they just sort of land and walk around. Um, this is way more flies than you need in a cage, but there's a minimum order. And in order to meet that, we end up with way more flies than we need. Anybody know what this is? It's carrot, it's not Queen Anne's lace. This is cytoplasmic male sterility. It's a naturally occurring element in um, the umble family and in carrots. The one on the left, you'll notice, looks weird. And that's because it doesn't have any pollen. And um, there are restorer genes. We can talk about the genetics of that. But if you see this, um, you don't have to panic. But it does look pretty different. It's kind of neat to look at under a microscope. This is what I wish all of my seed production cages looked like with carrots. This is actually Spring Market. It's a brilliant seed producer. And um, that's what I wish every cage looked like. This is what it looks like when we start getting some seed. We've got green uh, immature seed on the left and some nice looking mature seed on the right. This is what inventory management looks like when you have 15 cages full of carrots and they're all different colors and you've got different lots and you wanna keep them separate. And with that, I will leave off and entertain some questions from you and then come back at the end. Yeah, Nathaniel. The two red cabbages, yes, they are storage varieties. Um, how do you recommend making selections on spring cabbages for buying seed production? Like, yeah, during, during spring, like, letting it just like blow up all summer to try and store it somehow to retend it? Or? Great question, and I've just gotten the I don't know is the answer because I don't actually have any experience with spring cabbage, but I hear that Beth does, and she will be talking about that momentarily. Yeah. Wow, all right, so I just, I'm going to repeat um, the questions and suggestions because we are being recorded for eOrganic today, so I want to make sure that all of our online listeners and future listeners uh, are aware. So that was a suggestion to hook up a leaf blower to a sprayer to get a more effective, a or a tank. Yeah, and that dribbles down in front of the, the jet there. Oh, okay. All right, so using a leaf blower to disperse safer soap or a spray um, and a trickle in front of the leaf blower so that you get a nice broad spray. That also sounds fun. <laughs> Do it more time. 